Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Health Coaches Podcast. I am co-host number A, Howard Jacobson, and with me is... Co-host number two, Kevin Davis. I think that's letter two, you were supposed to say. Oh, man. But, all I'm right, just we'll, not we'll, as clever as Howard. We'll leave this in. It won't go in the blooper reel. So today, you wanted to talk about more or less, right? More or less. Yeah, that's more or less what I was thinking. Um, I, you know, I was uh, listening to a conversation with Dr. B, Dr. Will Bolsowitz, and uh, just something that struck me what, that was not really the topic of the conversation at all was that he mentioned the idea of trying to have his, his patients and, and folks that he's helping include more good things rather than worrying about what they need to get rid of. And I thought, you know, that's that's really a good and an interesting concept to think of as coaches. You know, when it comes to behavior change, sometimes it can be easier to add in, you know, a few bites of of spinach or you know what I mean, to 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 include something good for you rather than to try and fight off the craving for uh, something maybe less than ideal. Hmm. Um... Yeah, I have a I have a bunch of thoughts, as cool. as, as I sometimes do. Um, yeah. One is, as you know, that when when we're dealing when we as coaches deal with people who are struggling with their health and by mm -hmm. definition, people who pay for coaching are not having an easy time, typically. Yeah. Um, one of the things we see a lot is shame. Right. And shame is an inhibitory uh, emotion. It makes us stop what we're doing, freeze. It lowers our affect, lowers our energy. And so one of the antidotes to that is to get them to do something. Yeah, All right. Because if someone, you know, and, and what typically happens is what gets inhibited are good behaviors, right? People in shame tend not to inhibit their eating three out of three <laughs> sleeves of chocolate of, uh, of Oreo cookies. Right. That's not what it inhibits. It inhibits getting up and going for a walk or picking up the, the dumbbells and doing some squats. All right. So to focus on a thing they can do um, can start to get them out just by, you know, movement creates motion, motion creates thought and emotion. So to get them moving, to do something that they can do can kind of um, extract them a little bit from that sh that uh, that shame hole. Yeah, it's like shame is the anti momentum. Hmm. You know, I mean, we talk all the time about these uh, little wins and doing things, you know, just as as we've talked about here, if you can go do three squats and include those in your day, or if you can go eat, you know, like I mentioned earlier, a little bit of spinach instead of those Oreos or not even instead of just go eat the spinach that builds a momentum and you want to continue to do positive things. And that shame, it's so interesting how we respond to shame because, you know, you, you have that shame, that feeling about not having done the things that you say that you want or that will help with what you say that you want. And then the response to it is, well, I'm going to have an extra sleeve of Oreos. Yeah. Um, right. Another another um, another thing about adding things in is that actually it's easier to add things in than to inhibit. Right. So we talk a lot about um, dead person goals. Right. Like I will not eat those Oreos. Anything that a dead person can do better than you <laughs> is what we call a dead person goal. Like a dead yeah. person can resist Oreos better than you. Right. At best, you'll tie. At <laughs> best. That's winning is tying. <laughs> All right. And and frankly, you know, so in the inhibition of things isn't that much fun anyway, because it's not like you, you don't have a feeling of accomplishment after you just you're just sort of hanging on until the next time and then you've blown it. So we see all the all the time people who come in and they talk about their streaks and 
as it's, it's as if they're talking about their streak like a like a ticking bomb or they're hanging off the edge of a cliff onto a, a you know a root and their hands are getting sweatier and sweatier and their grip is getting more and more fatigued the that there's a sense that I can only hold out and resist this temptation for so long, as opposed to. So the difference between not eating a sleeve of Oreos and eating some spinach is after I've eaten the spinach, I've eaten spinach. Yeah. It's it's <laughs> it's done. I can put a check mark. Uh, yeah, I love that that uh, kind of last part of what you said there too. That mentality of you know where your thought process goes. That I've done this. You know, when you don't eat the Oreos, you don't have something to say that you that you have done. Um, it's just a void, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, yeah. I, and I mean, you know, when when you talk about including that stuff, it's it's it sort of crowds things out. You know, it doesn't leave room for those Oreos. And this was a big thing for me losing all that weight is, um, you know, and, and this kind of goes into the concept when we're talking about food specifically into the concept of um, calorie density. I, I love to eat a big meal mm -hmm. and I still love to eat a big meal, even though I weigh, you know, 80 or a hundred pounds less than I did at one point, you know, and, but my big meal now, like for example, tonight we're having dinner, we're going to have, uh, some curry my wife made, and it's got a whole bunch of different vegetables and things in it. And I'm going to put it over the top of a pound of okra. <sighs> Nice. That's no big deal. I can eat that pound of okra, and there's like 40 calories in that whole thing, you know, uh -huh. that whole pound of okra, you know. Um, versus, I could choose to have, you know, a pound of white rice. I don't know. That might be a little voluminous, but <laughs> but you know, a large portion equal, of, and it's going to have way more calories. Right, so. and yeah, what you said about about you know crowd, crowding out. Um, is really important because when we fixate on what we can't have, we've created a dynamic where we're constantly thinking about it. Like, I'm not going to eat the Oreos. I'm not going to eat the Oreos. Supposed to, if you discover, oh, I went to bed and I had all that okra and I had the curry and I wasn't hungry, you don't even think about what you didn't have. You can wake up a few days later and go, huh, it's been a week since I've had Oreos. Like it, it ceases to be the 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 spoke around which the 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 wheel of your life turns. I gotta know what kind of mattress you're on, Howard. To, to go sleep for several days, days later. Oh yeah, you said you wake up a couple days later. <laughs> yeah. Well, there was there was intervening awakeness during that time. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought that was Howard's trick to twenty four hour fasting. Yeah, sleep for eight hours. <laughs> just yes, yeah, just to keep. Uh... <laughs> I won't talk about the substances. It's yeah, <laughs> help with that. Um, all right, and the, you know the other thing is that um, that you can turn a negative into a positive. So you can so like instead of saying like, and we see, we see this a bunch of times on coaching calls where someone has thrown something out, right? Like they 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 have the Oreos in the house and they. They bought them. They're the only ones who would eat them. Nobody else is going to complain. And they actually in the coaching call, take it and like push it down the trash compactor or in the garbage. And then they sprinkle like, you know, ketchup or pepper on it. So they know that we know they're not going to go <laughs> dig it out later. And like any like the difference is not that it's a bad thing or a good thing. The, the real distinction is, are you doing something or refraining from doing something. So throwing out the cookies is actually different from not eating the cookies because you actually you can't not do something. You can only do things. So like right now, let's make a list of all the things you're not doing. <laughs> right? You're, you're not list. painting your toenails. You're, you're not um, trap shooting. You're you're not sewing a 19th century corset like it's, you know, all the things you're not doing are completely irrelevant. Well, the only thing that the only yeah. thing that we can say about you that will actually be useful is what you are doing. Yeah, and, and, and that's kind of what we always go for, right, is a, a, a tendency toward action. You know, we we want our clients to take to do something. 
And, you know, to the point where, for example, the, the program that Howard and I work with in Well Start Health, we talk about a daily do, which, you know, we want somebody to let us know, like, what is the, the action that you're, that, you know, that you intend yeah. to take today? Yep. And, um, and even in, we can tur even turn inhibition into an action. Because like this, I think this is like the, for me, the key that there is. Um, so one of my favorite songs is from the, the Sesame Street world. Um, I don't I don't know if you if you know it, it was a it was a mid 90s or early 90s um, song um, featuring um, Ernie and Hoots the Owl, who is a jazz musician. And Ernie wants to learn how to play the saxophone from Hoots. And the song is called Put Down the Ducky. And the problem is that Ernie <laughs> is holding on to his rubber duck. And so it keeps squeaking every time he tries to finger the, the notes on the saxophone. And so Hoots the Owl, the, the, the wise advice is put down the ducky if you want to play the saxophone. And like this is a, a perfect metaphor for certain behaviors are simply incompatible with other behaviors. So you so adding in the spinach may crowd out the Oreos. But when you get the urge to have Oreos to to help your clients do something else that's incompatible, pick up, yeah. pick up the ducky, whether that's a cup of tea, going for a walk, sitting and doing 10 minutes of, of uh, mindful breathing, push ups, crossword puzzle banging your head against the wall, it doesn't matter. Something that's incompatible with eating the Oreos. Right. I like that. Uh, I really so want to picking say, up the ducky instead of putting it down. That pick up the fun. ducky. I must feel like we need that as like a uh, an outro song or something for this episode. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I just I, I have a strong desire to get sued by Jeff Moss. You know, I don't know. <laughs> well, I think what is there? Isn't there like a limit like, you know, play? 30 seconds of something and it's yeah know. yeah for editor for editorial uh, purposes we can probably play a little bit 10 I seconds right i could probably just sing it for you next week why not today because i don't remember <laughs> the, all the lyrics okay so I, I i could i could do that whole album because um when when this was like my daughter was like a year old i wanted to take her on the back of the bicycle and so she, we had a little trailer for her and we had this tape that she and she would be fine as long as we played the tape. But then, yeah. like when the batteries ran out, I was like 12 miles from home and I was like, OK, <laughs> <laughs> gee, 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 Bert. Uh, yeah, Ernie. <laughs> so I <laughs> get the whole thing memorized. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Pick, uh... Figure out what your ducky is and, and, and pick it up as a way of of, of positive inhibition. Well, and, you know, something just kind of to mention quickly about that is that is a great activity or a great um, exercise for us to do with the client as the coach is to discuss and help them determine what is the ducky. Yes. Yeah. Um, so an example that, that from, from my own life is when I um, learned how to juggle. Um, I actually I actually had learned that I started teaching juggling and the most useful book that I ever found for teaching juggling was called Body Learning by Michael Gelb, who subsequently wrote a bestseller called How to Think Like Leonardo da Vinci. And he talked about the principle of inhibition and how we can practice inhibition. So, for example, like the reason people fail to juggle is that they they go for the catch and no matter how bad their throw is, they're, you know, they're reaching way out here, way out there to make the catch. And once once you do that, you've done two things. First of all, you're way out of position for the next set of throws and catches. And second, you've just taught yourself that that's a good throw because a catch is positive feedback. So we want to get people to not catch bad throws, which is almost impossible. And the way I would teach people is I would have them stand a couple feet away from me with their hand out. And I would say, I'm going to throw the ball to you and don't move to catch it. And I would throw it two, two, three feet. To, and at first they would, and they, you know, like all I told them was don't move. And they that makes me 
like I feel like tight in my chest just thinking <laughs> like you just saying that and thinking about not trying to catch it. <laughs> yeah. And so gradually they they learn to inhibit. And so that yeah. so if you're talking about, you know, inhibition, this is actually a positive exercise because inhibition is usually about like it's not a formula. It's simply a trying not to do something. But when you're actually OK, I'm getting the craving. Then I'm going to consciously let the craving be. So this is like, you know, acceptance and mindfulness because they weren't trying to change the, the trajectory of the ball I threw with them. They right. were trying to do nothing or they were trying to not try to do anything. So um, this is why Howard throws Oreos at his clients. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, while they're sleeping. Yeah. Try not to eat this. Whack. <laughs> yeah. yeah, with 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 my with my with my aim, I'd probably get it right in their mouth by accident. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so there's lots of ways as coaches that we can that we can play with this. And I want to um, you know, emphasize that, that when we're doing this well, it is a form of play, because as you said, like there's a ducky. What is it? Let's be creative. Let's let that person think about because now we're getting to think, you know, when I started talking about all the things you weren't doing, I bet you were going, hmm, it might be fun to paint my toenails while I'm wearing a 19th century corset. <laughs> That's exactly what I was thinking. Yeah. So I, mean, like, I was thinking that before you said it, but <laughs> <laughs> but like, you know, the, the human imagination is the ability to, to think about things that don't exist. And right. so if the thing doesn't exist in their life and they can think, hey, maybe I could do this. Maybe I could play darts. Maybe I could uh, draw mandalas. Maybe I could. Whatever, like th that creative process then then opens up new possibilities, new opportunities. Yeah. So, uh, before we before we sign sayonara off, um, we're starting a new coach training end of September. What uh, you got any? Uh, any thoughts about uh, who should sign up for this? Well, everyone, of course. But. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, the coach training, you know, and we of course we frame things as coaching, um, you know, it, but what I want people to keep in mind, you know, there's a lot of people that we've had go through this who are other types of healthcare professionals, mm. doctors and pharmacists and uh, dietitians and, and uh, physical therapists and things. And it can be really helpful in just building these skills so that you can speak to people and to help them work on any sorts of, of improvement in their life. So you don't have to just be someone who wants to have a health coaching business where someone you know pays you to coach them through um, an activity. So that is a big thing that I wanted to keep in mind for people. Yeah, yeah. And, and those those are the people who um, often get the, the biggest bang for their buck the quickest. Like we've heard from a lot of doctors who come in in week two. They're like, oh, I now have a I have a better tool for helping my patients, you know, cut down on the amount of red meat they're eating. Yeah. So it gets very, very exciting. Well, I mean, if you think about it, those those are the people who are seeing someone all day long and have the opportunity to practice these skills and apply them, you know, on on day one. Yeah. So. You know, and as, as we talked about a while ago, I think not not on the air. Um, mm -hmm. One of our frustrations with this wonderful world of lifestyle medicine that we're in is the issue of use effectiveness. So the prescriptions really work if you take the pills. And if you're giving people actual pills for, you know, blood pressure meds or statins and people take them, it's pretty easy to get people to be compliant with pills. We have found it much harder to get people to be compliant with lifestyles, with changing their diet with. And, and there's, you know, there's obvious reasons for that. And there's a reason that everyone loves pills better than actually doing hard work. But if lifestyle medicine is to gain credibility, the number one thing it has to prove is it works and not working theoretically, but actually working. And I think lifestyle medicine practitioners, doctors, nurses, physical therapists, uh, dietitians, everyone in the field, we have to get good at helping people change 
And motivational interviewing was a good first step, but it is not enough. And the just the, the idea of motivational interviewing is that we're trying to motivate them to do the thing that we know that they should do. And as any, you know, as anyone ever tried to motivate you, Kevin, to do what they what you knew they wanted you to do, you're immediately going to resist or you're going to be compliant and compliance right. has its own leaks, right? Because like nobody wants to go out in the world like, you know, what kind of life did you lead? I was compliant. Like maybe I did what they said, maybe in some cultures that's like a, a virtue, but certainly not in our in the one we're in now. So to be able to have all these other tools to help people explore what really matters to them and how they can operationalize that through themselves taking action, I think is really, really key. So I would love to make a call to people who are in lifestyle medicine who are frustrated by the lack of adoption and maintenance of all the healthy things we know people should do plant based diets, daily vigorous movement, stress management, sleep, social support that um, that you consider gaining these skills. Um, and if you want to gain these skills with us, we would be honored to work with you. We would. We'd love to have you. And we you know, and one of the things that we really because we haven't talked a whole lot about detail of, of our coaching program on here. But one of the things that we also have is we've built now this community of practitioners who mm. have gone through the program. And so, you know, as you go through the program, obviously you're with your group of, you know, I don't know, 12 people or, you know, for example, however many people there are that you're going through with for that period of a few months. But then after that, you're also a part of this whole big community of people. Um, and we've got ongoing calls and um, uh, groups to, to have conversation with with other folks that have gone through at different times. So we really have a, a good support within that community. Yep. So, so next time we can we'll talk about other groups that we think would be a, a good fit. But if people want to uh, find out more and um, Get in get an have a schedule an interview, an enrollment interview. They should go to Health Coaches Podcast. Oh wait, no. No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm gonna say the wrong one. This is a really long <laughs> blooper reel, man. Yeah, wow. They should go to wellstartcoach.com. <laughs> Wellstartcoach.com. Read about it, watch some videos. We're we're hoping to get some more um, testimonials or people's experiences who just finished the last cohort. I'm hoping to get a few of them up sooner rather than later. Um, but if you have questions, you can ask. And um, bec because we want to make sure that it's a group that's useful for everybody, we you can't get in without a 30 minute enrollment interview. So uh, we just make sure we have a, you know, a copacetic group um, all all on the same page, working together and all uh, of a mindset and a character that would be supportive of that of that group's efforts. Yes. So uh, with that, what's your favorite Sesame Street song? I don't even know. It's been a while, man. Yeah. Oh, you 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 enjoyed Sesame Street as a consumer, right? Oh yeah, thirty whatever, seven years ago or something. Okay. <laughs> yeah. See, I was sort of tail end of that. I, I considered myself, you know, too old for it until I became an adult, and then I really liked it again. Yeah, I was early 80s. So, you know, it was definitely going strong. Gotcha. No, I was, you know, well, I was more Zoom and Electric Company. Oh, nice. And Zoom really hung out until this pandemic. They really. Uh... Yeah, <laughs> they're very popular. Again. Very popular. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. So uh, I'll, I'll learn the words. Maybe I'll. Uh... Yeah. yeah. Add that to the looper reel. Yeah. Trouble. The trouble is that um, Poots the Owl is all is voiced by the same guy who also voices Elmo. Um, and, you know, Elmo's very high, but Hoots the Owl ugh, is like low and gravelly. And I think if I sing him, I wouldn't be able to talk for two days. Uh, so, so you just need to do it a couple of days before we record the next uh, episode. Yeah, I, was, I could do it on Friday and then my family would be really happy all weekend. <laughs> yeah, perfect. <laughs> All right, man. Well, sounds good. Sounds good. Um, folks, wellstartcoach.com. Uh, if you're interested in finding out about how to be a kick ass health coach and to uh, promote the lifestyle medicine movement in the world.
Yes. To, uh, and then otherwise, healthcoachespodcast.com and, and iTunes and Stitcher and all those things to uh, to check out what we're doing here in case you haven't already and are somehow hearing this. Yep. All right, man. See you later. All right. Thanks, Howie.